Good morning, everybody. How's everybody this morning? You better move this or I'm sure to spill it. How's the week? Everybody have a good week? Yeah, good, good. I want to let you know if you have something on your mind, um, don't forget that there are prayer cards in our pews. So if you have a prayer or someone you know needs prayer, um, fill out the card. You can drop it in the the, the tithe plate or the offering plate, and um, we'll be sure to get that added onto our list of our prayer list so that the church can be in prayer for those folks or, or for you, if whoever it may be. Okay? Um, this morning, we have a lot to cover this morning, so uh, I hope you have confidence in the person you're sitting next to. Uh, if you get a little tired, you may need to lean on their shoulder a little bit. Uh, they may nudge you to, to keep you awake. But I promise you this is going to be a, a, a sermon that you're going, not going to want to miss. Um, a lot of important information we're going to be talking about this morning. I had a conversation, or I've had a conversation in the past with a, a Christian, a relative who was of the Christian faith, or claimed to be of the Christian faith. She said she was Christian, and her understanding of the Christian faith was that she could live however she wanted to live, because God would forgive her regardless. So she had no problem living in sin. And for her, it was a perfect relationship. She liked to sin. God likes to forgive. So it was a perfect marriage as far as she was concerned. Now, maybe you know someone like that, or someone who has said something like that in the past, or maybe you know someone who's living a lifestyle like that. Um, they won't come right out and say it. But they believe the same thing. Well, it was Solomon who said, there's nothing new under the sun, right? And it has been, these thoughts, and people having these thoughts, has been a common misunderstanding of the Christian faith ever since the days of the apostles. And as I said before, in the, first, the book of 1 John that we've been in, and we're going to continue our series today, John was confronting the false teachers who were denying the reality of Christ's incarnation. And they were trying to deceive the people of the church by getting them to follow them, follow their lies, and understand a false gospel. And this morning, we're going to see that John counters their claims by laying out various ways that someone can determine who the children of God are. Last week, we saw that God's children abide in Christ and look forward to His return. That was one of the themes of last week's message. They look forward to it because they've already been wrapped in Christ's righteousness, so they have nothing to fear. They don't have any fear of judgment. When God's children are resurrected, they will be resurrected with glorified bodies, so it's not a day that God's children need to fear. It's a day that God's children long for. We look forward to Christ coming back, right? And the practical implication of these things is that God's children long to be pure even now. And this brings us to our passage this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, would you turn with me or swipe on your favorite Bible app on your phone to 1 John chapter 3, 4 through 10. 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. And I'll read those. He says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen Him or known Him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as He is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he was born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now, 
Looking at last week, back to last week's message, we'll be able to identify the children of God when Christ returns because we'll be fully conformed into Christ's image and we'll have our glorified bodies. But how can you identify the children of God now? Notice verse 10 says, By this it is, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. John contrasts two types of children here, and their two corresponding lifestyles. The children of God practice righteousness and love. The children of the devil practice sin and hate. And like previous weeks, here we see John using contrast to make his points. But we need to consider something else first. We need to consider the seriousness of sin. Let's spend a few minutes talking about that. The seriousness, seriousness of sin. In order to grasp, grasp John's argument, we need to understand that sin is serious. It's no small thing. It is a detestable and repulsive thing when we consider its nature and its origin. John speaks of its nature in verse 4 when he says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Sin at its root is going against God's holy law and rebelling against the, our Most High God. This is what sin was when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. They thought they would overthrow God's authority. But what they really did was throw themselves and all of humanity into sin and death. If you want to know how serious sin is, take a look around you. Look around at all the suffering that we experience in this world as a result of the fall. Sin is not only offensive at its core, it is an insult to our Almighty God. It is to be despised because of its consequences. Think of the consequences of sin. Women experience pain in childbearing because of sin. Husbands and wives argue because of sin. Our work comes through great pain, sweat, and frustration because of sin. Sin has brought curse upon this world. And the worst part of it all is that sin has earned us death and eternal separation from God. Sin is destructive no matter how small you might think some sins are. Every sin, whether private or public, is lawlessness and worthy of eternal death. I know, that sounds harsh, right? That sounds harsh. But God hates sin. It's the only thing He hates. So not only are we called as God's children to love God and love one another, we also are called to hate sin. Friendship with sin is eternal suicide. And God goes on in verse 8 to show again how serious sin is. Not only is it detestable by its nature and it's diabolical in its origins, it is of the devil. John says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. And the devil has been sinning from the beginning. You see, folks, there are two fathers and two types of children. Those who make a practice of sinning are of their father, the devil. And those who Jesus said to the Jews, and to the Jews who rejected him, Jesus says, you are, of, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. To practice sin is to do the will of the devil. And so the next time you're tempted to sin, remember just how serious sin is. Sometimes we can deceive ourselves about this, folks. And we think that, well, it's not such a big lie. It's not, this sin's not a big deal. But we must remember the suffering on the cross that Christ went through in order to save us and redeem us from our sins. He gave His life for us. Sin is serious, folks. The cross shows us just how serious sin is to God and brings with it conviction and comfort for sinners who believe that Christ has come to save them. 
That's where John goes next. The purpose of Christ's coming. Last week, John looked forward to the second coming of Christ and how it should reflect our way of living. Right? Remember that from last week? Well, this week, he looked back to the first coming of Christ and shows how it too should affect the way that we live now. And his main point is this. No one who makes a practice of sinning denies the purpose of Christ's first coming. Let me, let me correct myself. The one who makes practice of sinning denies the purpose of Christ's first coming. This was just another, another subtle way of the Gnostic folks, the Gnostic false teachers of, of John's day, denying the Incarnation. They denied it in their speech, and they denied it through their immoral lifestyles. But John says, if you put verse 5 and, verse, and the second half of verse 8 together, we can read, You know that He appeared to take away sin, and in Him there is no sin. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Christ came on a mission. He was a one-man army. He came to conquer your sin, and He came to conquer the devil. And He did conquer your sin, and He did conquer the devil by not sinning. This is why John stresses the point that in Him there is no sin in verse 5. It was absolutely necessary that Jesus remain spotless and free of sin. He had, or we had to have a Savior who would keep the law and save us from our lawlessness. John Gresham Machen, probably don't, aren't familiar with that name, but he founded the Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. When he was dying on his deathbed, he had only a few words left in him. And those few words that he spoke were, I am so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. No hope without it. And then he passed. Brothers and sisters, sisters, we should be extremely thankful that Christ kept the law and never once sinned. Without being obedient, He would never have been able to save us from our disobedience. Take a look at what Paul wrote in Romans 5. Paul wrote, Therefore, as one trespass led to damnation for condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the man will be made righteous. The many will be made righteous. But because he did obey and died on the cross, he removed the guilt and sin from those who look to Him by faith. The psalmist wrote, as far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. Because He conquered sin, He can remove sin from us. Where Adam failed, Christ succeeded. And He ultimately triumphed over sin and the devil on the cross. In the garden, it appeared that the devil had spoiled God's plan through the sin and fall of Adam and Eve. But God promised from Eve's offspring would come a Savior, right? The offspring of Satan would try to stamp out the offspring of Eve so that the Savior could not come. But at some point, we know, history, the Savior would come. Look at Genesis 3.15 I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Between your, the devil's offspring. There's a whole other track that we could go down on and we could get lost in rabbit holes all day long on it. The devil had offspring? He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Have you ever been stung by a bee or a wasp? Doesn't feel good, does it? Have you ever tried to or squash that bug that stung you after it's bitten you because you're, you're so mad? I can tell you, at my house, I get stung by a wasp. Stuff's getting broke. Stuff's coming off the walls. It, it's, that's happening. Until that thing is dead, I'm coming for it. 
Well, that's what Jesus did on the cross. When He died on the cross, He bruised the heel. He crushed, it, he crushed the, the serpent's head, the devil's head. You can take comfort in the fact that Jesus came to take away sin and to destroy the works of the devil. I'll say it again. A person who makes a practice of sin denies the purpose of Christ's first coming and the work that He accomplished. And that's not all. The one who practices sin also denies the power of Christ and that the power that Christ has given to God's children to resist Satan and flee from sin. Now for Christian, there are practical implications of Christ's coming. And here's where it gets a little, little dicey for us. John says in verse 6 through 9, or 6 and 9, verse 6, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. And no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. And then 9 says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. What is John saying here? Is he suggesting that Christians do not commit sins? What about his earlier statements that seem to say Christians do sin? If we go back to chapter 1, a few weeks back, chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That seems to indicate that we do have sin and can sin. And Later, in chapter 2, verse 1, John says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. How can verses 6 and 9 be reconciled with those two verses I just read? Is John contradicting himself? These are legitimate questions. In fact, it opens up a whole series of questions. Can a Christian sin and still be a Christian? And if they can't sin, how much can they sin? This is important stuff and we need to try to answer it. And in trying to answer it, let's first talk about the perfectionist. The perfectionist says the Christian can reach a place where he doesn't sin. Doesn't sin at all. And you have to work to get to that place. Perfectionism is usually associated with some form of Armenian theology, which also believes that you can lose your salvation. So you get your salvation, and you sin a little, you lose your salvation, you pray a little, you get your salvation back, and that process goes and ebbs and flows until eventually you make progress and you reach a point of perfection that you don't sin at all. And then you can't lose your salvation because you've reached a point where you have been perfected. Perfected on this side of heaven. This is often called the doctrine of eradication. It's as if the sin nature in us has been eradicated. Is that what John's saying here? That a true Christian, the ultimate Christian, is one who reaches a point of sinlessness? Now, on the other hand, you have the antinomian view. That's a big word. Nomos is the Greek word for law. So antinomian means against the law. That is the people who sort of live without regard for the law of God. And they say Christians can sin because Christians do sin. And frankly, it doesn't matter because we're all under grace anyways. Grace covers absolutely everything. So who's right? Are the perfectionists right? Can we reach a point of sinless perfection on this side of heaven? Are the antinomians correct in saying, look, you're going to sin. You cannot not sin. So don't make a big issue out of it. That's what grace is for. Grace covers it. You're good. Is that the right answer? Neither are actually correct. Christians do sin, but it does matter, folks. How do I know that? Because I am one. And that's how you know it as well. You are. 
And because the Bible does say, it says, if we don't sin, if we say we don't sin, that we lie. We do sin, and it matters. That's why chapter 2 says, I'm writing these things to you, in verse 1, that you may not sin. You do sin, but you should not sin. Well, maybe you're saying, that's fine. But then how can John say in verse 6, no one who abides in him sins, and no one who has sinned has seen him or knows him? How can he say that? How do we explain that statement? Well, there are many explanations that have been offered. Some, looking through commentaries this week, lots of commentaries this week, some say the definition of sin refers only to mortal sins. That's been the historic Catholic view. I don't see John drawing any distinction here like that. Some argue that it means God doesn't regard it as sin anymore. Well, you're believers now. You're born again, so now it's not called sin anymore. Well, that's the very thing John is arguing about in this letter. The Gnostics that are there saying, oh, you're good. He's saying that if you treat sin with indifference, then you're not a Christian. And some say it refers to the new nature and that your new creation can't sin. Well, you can't force the passage to be segmented and you, you can't separate me into two categories. When I sin, I sin. I acknowledge that sin. It can't just refer to the, to the flesh, or the old nature. It's as if somehow my old nature has been divorced from me and I'm not responsible for it anymore. No, that's not the case. And still others say it only refers to willful, deliberate sin. One commentator even says this, a Christian doesn't do sin, he suffers it. In other words, there's a sin that just happens to me and I'm a victim of it rather than doing it. Well, there's no indication that John's saying that at all in this text. These weren't the only views to consider, but for the sake of time this morning, the correct view is based on the tenses of the Greek. Believe it or not, it comes down to our grammar. Who knew? Now, we could get all geeky and go to the original manuscripts and the languages and, the, and walk through this, but for the sake of time, let me summarize it. The typical ancient Greek writings expected, would have expected the tense called an aorist tense. Those of you who are English majors or grammar, grammar language, or if you're into that kind of stuff, the aorist tense communicates a one-time action. So, I run or I ran. But John uses an unexpected and atypical present tense verb when he wrote this in the, in the ancient Greek. And the present tense, the, in, the, in the present tense, in the Greek can carry an element of continuation or habitual. Okay? Scholars think this shows that John was carefully crafting his language to communicate that Christians, although they commit sin, they are not to continue living in it continuously or habitually. Now this is amplified, a problem for us, because when we start looking across various versions of the Bible, we will see that some Bible versions miss that present tense, miss that verb, and they are written in the aorist tense. And that causes a problem for us because the aorist tense would say the Christian no longer sins. Now, should we have to go through all this to understand the Bible? Is it really that difficult? Does it have to be? There's got to be an easier way, right? And yes, fortunately I think there is. We must first always remember, here's the number one rule of interpreting the Bible. If you leave here with anything today, take this with you. Scripture is the best interpreter of Scripture. So what's really at stake here? Keeping that in mind, Scripture interprets Scripture. What's really at stake here? Well, in this passage, we have two options, right? Either John is saying 
that God's children do not commit sin and cannot sin, or he's saying God's children cannot practice sin or keep on sinning. In order to decide which is correct, think about what we've already covered in 1 John. Remember this is a letter written to believers. So remember that John has already said in 1 John 1 verse 8, we read it earlier, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Folks, we cannot deny our sin nature, and we cannot deny that we commit sin. And he goes further in chapter 2, verse 1. We read this too. While revealing one of the purposes of his letter, he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. These verses should inform us and help us interpret John's words in this passage this morning. John is not preaching about sinless perfection of four believers. Instead, what he's saying is that children of God cannot be characterized by a lifestyle of sin. The children of Satan, on the other hand, are characterized by a lifestyle of sin. Paul dealt with this same misunderstanding when he wrote Romans chapter 6. He said, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, he says. No! How can we who died to sin still live in it? Paul denied this understanding of the Christian faith, and John does as well right here, and maybe even more forcefully. John says in verse 6, No one who is content to live in sin and makes a practice of sinning has neither seen Him or known Him. Christ. That's pretty disconnected. And further, John says, this person who continues in sin is a child of the devil. Again, John's use of contrast, we also see in verse 10, that the one who practices righteousness shows evidence of being righteous and that he or she is a child of God. This is a very simple test for determining who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 7, only He said a little more. He hide, hid His words a little bit. More of a, of a parable. He says, So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. The righteousness that we practice is fruit and evidence that we are in fact abiding in Christ and are born of God. John also tells us that the reason we cannot practice sin is because, verse 9, God's seed abides in us. I said last week, we benefit from being both born, adopted, and married into the family of God. Remember that from last week? But we also are God's children in a transformative sense. That, we, that means we, we share the family traits. Just as children look like their parents and their siblings, Christians also resemble each other as part of God's family. So no matter what our earthly families and nationalities look like, there is a resemblance across Christians. Now, if you're still with me, if you've hung on, I can imagine at least two reactions to this passage so far. Some of you are hearing what John is saying, and you're encouraged. You're thinking, this is so encouraging, because this means that my desire to be free from the sin in my life, even though I stumble sometimes, This is genuine evidence that I'm a child of God. If this is what you've taken from this passage, great. John would want you to be encouraged by these words if you genuinely hate sin and fight against it. He wrote this epistle to give assurance to God's children. And you can be encouraged that God's seed abides in you and that Paul, when he wrote to the Philippians, says, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That Paul was speaking truth. Now on the other hand, 
Some of you may be hearing what John is saying and you may be discouraged. And you're discouraged because you think, I struggle with so much sin. If this is your reaction to John's words, I want to encourage you too. That's one of the marks of a Christian to struggle with sin. John is not speaking against those who struggle with sin. He is speaking against those who don't struggle with sin because they could care less about sin. That's the problem. The type of Christian that John is describing in our passage this morning is the one who isn't perfect, but is also the one who's not content to stay there, to stay in sin. So if you are discouraged by the struggles in your life, take heart because it is evidence that you are being given the Spirit of Christ, which wages war on your old nature. Jesus Christ came and worked for you. And He's working in you by His Spirit so that more and more you die to sin and live for Him. So take refuge in Him. Live out of the truth that your sins are completely forgiven. Walk in the strength of His Spirit. If you are discouraged with what lies behind you, your past, don't look back at your life. Look back at the life of Christ. And look forward to Christ's return where you will be made like Him. Remember last week we said you were going to have glorified bodies and we will be made like Him. Our greatest resource of assurance is looking to Jesus Christ. As we look to Jesus Christ, the Spirit is transforming us more and more into His image so that we more and more bear the fruit of righteousness. This is the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Well-known Baptist pastor, I think he's well-known, um, and former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, Adrian Rogers. Some of you may be familiar with that name. He has some, some awesome quotes. and He's quoted as saying, a Christian leaps into sin and loathes it. A non-Christian leaps into sin and loves it. John said that Jesus came to defeat the work of the devil. And the work of the devil is to get people to sin. This is the heart of the Gospel. John is pleading for us to not be deceived into thinking that sin is no big deal. So let me ask you, if a person says that they are Christian, but they in fact practice a lifestyle of sin, are they or are they not born again? Interesting question. This may, may, familiar, may be familiar to you. May you have to go back to memory banks a little bit. Kenneth Lay. Kenneth Lay, know who he is? Kenneth Lay was the CEO of Enron Corporation back in the 90s. And there was a huge fraud deal with Enron, Enron Energy Corporation. In fact, one of the companies of Enron was here in Omaha. Um, He allowed the books, the financial books, to be falsified and fabricated into looking like the business was a moneymaker, when in fact it was losing money. He sold $300 million worth of his stock while he was telling his employees and other investors that everything was fine. Lay was the son of a Baptist preacher, and he had a son who was studying ministry. Lay claimed to be a Christian. He was a church member, and he gave a lot of money to ministry. Lay was convicted on 10 counts of fraud and was facing a prison sentence of probably more than 30 years. But he died before he was able to be sentenced. Was he a Christian? The Bible says that those who cheat won't go to heaven. What about adulterers? Can someone be married and have an ongoing illicit affair with someone else and still be a child of God? What about idolaters? Idolatry is making something else more important than God. Can you make your work, or you can make your work more important? You can make your spouse or your child more important. You can make your reputation or your possessions more important. The Bible says that those who practice idolatry 
are not born of God and will not go to heaven. What about homosexuals? I realize that that's a very polarizing word these days to even mention homosexuals in a religious context. And I have friends and relatives who I dearly love, and yet they lead that lifestyle. But the fact remains that practicing a homosexual lifestyle is forbidden in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexual sexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now all of this raises a question about how do we view God? We are tempted to see God the way we want Him to be rather than how He has revealed Himself to us. In an interview with Parade Magazine, the musician Elton John, everybody know who Elton John is? Elton John, when asked the question, who was Jesus? His response was, I think Jesus was a compassionate, super intelligent gay man who understood human problems. One of the easiest ways to commit sin is to remake God into our image. If you want the culture's view of God, go look at Parade Magazine. If you want an accurate view of God, go look at the Bible. It also raises a question about our hermeneutics. That's a fancy word, right? Hermeneutics. It's just a fancy for, word for how we interpret the Bible. Is it a collection of nice sayings or recommendations? Or is it the Word of God in a perfect source of truth and divine revelation? Folks, if we don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God, that it is the supreme authority for guiding our understanding of God and how life is lived in obedience to Him, then we might as well toss it in the trash and go find something else to do on Sunday morning. The fact that the Bible says that people who practice sin are not born of God and will not inherit the kingdom of God highlights the need for me to be incarnational and missional. Maybe you ask, well, what does that mean? It means I must live in such a way that God's presence comes through my life and I'm joining God to seek those who are lost from Him. I'm not called to be harsh, critical, judgmental, or holier than thou. God has called me and He calls you to be humble. Not be prideful and think that we're better than others. He calls us to be concerned. God makes the final determination whether or not someone is born of Him or not. But if there's some question mark in our heart about someone, we should look for evidence, fruit of Christ in his or her life. And we should pray for the Holy Spirit to convict and stir that person's heart toward God. And God calls us to be available. Yes, this is the hard one, folks. Even the worst sinner, the worst you can even imagine, we should be willing to come alongside and love and care about this person with the hope of salvation. There's no room for hate in our hearts to distance ourselves from those who are living lifestyles that we don't approve of or that aren't biblical. Whether or not we approve of it or not, it's not biblical. And as I wrap up this morning, let me close with just a couple questions that I'll ask you to consider for this week. Are you a Christ follower? Have you believed in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and committed yourself to following Him? And is it clear that you practice righteousness and love, or do you pretend? And third, 
Are you incarnational and missional? Remember, that means that you live in such a way that God's presence comes through your life and you're joining Him in His mission, seeking out those who are lost for Him. Let's think about those this week. Will you join me in prayer? Father, let us never forget the seriousness of sin. And let us always look to Jesus Christ who came to take away sin and to destroy the works of the devil. Thank You for Jesus who is the Christ, the Son of God who came in the flesh. Amen.